started Make Life Fun podcast because I needed more fun in my life. When I became a mother, I, for some reason, just put on this like high ponytail, mom jeans, and nose to the ground. I wasn't having fun. It wasn't until I started having fun that it started becoming easy. Fun and mental health go hand in hand for me. I've been in this mental health game my whole life. <laughs> and I am so lit up to like help other people. I'm so lit up for other people to experience this because it's what my wish and my mission is for every woman is to find safety within themselves because it took me a long time to get here. Hi guys, welcome back to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so happy that you're here today. Today on the show, I have Harriet McGuigan on the show with us today, and I'm so excited for you guys to meet her. Welcome, Harriet. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's so nice to meet you and to have you here. Will you please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, I'm in Ireland and you're over in Idaho. I'm 44, will be 45 in July, and I have a a son who will be 13 in March, 11th of March, and my daughter will be 15 in summer. So I'm at the moment parenting a nearly teenager and a teenager. And I also work as a psychotherapist with families and teenagers. Yeah, people that get drawn to my work, you know, but a lot of the work I do is family work. Yes, and that's the big umbrella here is helping moms to thrive as raising teenagers. And with being a teenage mom, what are you finding right now in the moment of going through it yourself? <laughs> like you were telling me about your beautiful little boy who's 10 months. Yeah. Is that right? I'm a real believer and I've always believed that, I suppose, from my interest in how we operate as humans, that you put the groundwork in, the teenage years are easier to manage. Mm. Yeah, so you start parenting your teenager when they're from the minute they arrive even Mm. when they're in the room you build up on it and I suppose having compassion for yourself and you were talking about that that's the real aim of your podcast the more compassion I have for myself then the more I can kind of ride out the struggles of my teenagers and Mm. be kind to myself when I don't know how to get it right and help them when they don't know how to manage things. Yeah, that's beautiful that you say that it starts from plant. It's like planting a seed. You have to start it from the beginning. And then when you get to the teenagers, even though they're still going to be their own humans and have their own, like want to explore, they're still going to have the seed that you've planted in them. So if you could give our listeners a little bit of talking a little bit about that planting the seed. I guess it's like, it's a really important, it's managing the nervous system of the little of your baby you know and all the touch that you do and all the chatting and you know the way your baby's interacting with you and you're speaking to your baby and he's speaking back so all of that is the foundation of how we'll interact with our teenagers Mm -hmm. so it's kind of like as you say the seed you you might not see the bent the rewards but i suppose we know now with psychology and all the neuroscience and all the research that's done that the brain i suppose we create neural pathways the more we're interdependent beings rather than independent Mm -hmm. so your baby like what's his name your little boy he's everett everett Yeah, Yeah. Everett will be who he is in the mirror of how mom responds to him. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when mom, like for all of us, when we're struggling or feeling low or struggling with postnatal depression or all the different struggles that moms go through, that's why it's really crucial that early intervention because Everett and all the little 10 month olds Mm -hmm. only know who they are through the eyes of mom and dad. Mm -hmm. And mom is usually the main caregiver, not that dad isn't in lots of babies' lives, but usually it's the female that is in the child's life Mm -hmm. more often. So how we are in ourselves as the mother or the caregiver, it isn't a luxury, Mm -hmm. you know, to be well. It actually is the only way that they can be okay. That Mm -hmm. they, their brain, physically, we now do MRI scans. So it's quite advanced and scientific now. So we can now see a neglected baby's brain. The gray matter is much thinner. There's less going on in the frontal cortex, which is the area that helps us have empathy and compassion and think of others. Mm -hmm. So it's very important what happens in the earlier years. Yes. And so can you speak to that a little bit? Because I love that you're talking about how the baby, our child at that small age only sees themselves through like us, like in our self-regulation. 
Yeah. And that yeah, self-regulation. And I think that self-regulation is huge. And I've been personally practicing it since before Everett was born. I didn't know what I was doing when I was doing the hypnobirthing and the meditating. But I have found that now, because we did that work of the hypnobirthing and the meditating, that he is a lot calmer. And people comment on that all the time. And I have to believe that there has to be something to that. That was probably your intuition as well. And maybe a mixture of your background experience. And yeah, it makes sense, doesn't it? If you think yeah. like we know ourselves when we get a hug, even if we can't sort something out, it's impossible to fix the hug calms our nervous system mm. as, as humans. So that's why obviously with COVID and everything, when there was so much, everyone having to keep apart, it had a huge impact on, on the brain and yeah. for older people and stuff so for babies it kind of the brain multiplies up to three years old i mean we can still repair what happens after three but zero in the womb to three is that real like crucial crucial period mm -hmm. for minding the child's brain it's like that's why i suppose it's so important to mind ourselves as moms and mm -hmm. if we feel we're struggling to push ourselves to get the support because it's not about us anymore like I know when I become a mom, it's another kind of motivating factor to self-care because mm -hmm. this isn't just about, the book doesn't just stop with me. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, becoming a mom kind of burst open that I was always interested in being the best version of myself. However, when they came along, it was just like all bets were off. Mm -hmm. It was like, it really pushed me past the people pleasing and the just becoming more discerning. And that's had, I've had to keep learning as life presents itself. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. All that you were saying that zero to three is so crucial. And I love that you said it's like, not just about us anymore. Being our best versions for our kids becomes crucial. And though we can repair from zero to three, it's better that we start there to do the best that we can, not just for our little ones, but for ourselves. And I know that the woman and the mom that's listening right now is probably asking herself that question, like that self-care, what can that even look like? Yeah, Speak and that's on. where we come back to again, we're interdependent beings rather than, you know, I think there's a lot of buzzword about self-care and taking time to yourself. A lot of people due to not having enough regulation when they were younger will actually need the self-care to happen through the other. So it mm -hmm. may be through therapy, life coaching, group work, and getting involved with agencies that will help you and your baby. Like in Ireland, we have like Bernardo's, which work crucial with, which like a lot of their work is from zero to three years mm -hmm. with the children. So they work with mothers. So it's having that intuitive knowing, and um, you know, I'm drowning a bit here because the ghosts of our past come up through every age our children are. So sometimes we've buried a lot of stuff and like it could be that we were hospitalized as babies or there was parental separation or there was addiction. So all of those traumas kind of evoke themselves when the baby arrives. And sometimes people don't have the capacity to be aware of that. And it's kind of like there for the grace of God go I, you know, and that's why we have a lot of trouble with, you know, teenagers and families in the States, in Ireland, worldwide. A really amazing book that I just found fascinating, which I've read lots of books, but it's What Happened to You by, it's an interview between Oprah Winfrey and Dr. Bruce Perry, who's a neuroscientist, and he's talking about kind of the effects of trauma. And um, it's not about what's wrong with you, it's what happened to you, you know, and so, because for anyone listening that says, oh my God, now my kid is over three and I didn't deal with my mm -hmm. postnatal depression or the amazing thing about our brain is that it actually is malleable. We know now it's not fixed. So with the right interventions, we mm -hmm. can have a good enough life alongside our trauma. We're forever changed with trauma. That might sound like a paradox because I said the brain is malleable, but like we, we, we will have, we will be impacted. Like if we got burnt, like mm -hmm. physically, if someone got burnt, they're going to have some scars. However, we don't have, we, we're much more than our trauma as well. And learning, like what you said about like being aware to do the hypnobirthing and the meditation. And there's lots of things we can. So a long answer to what you said about the self-care, it really varies for everyone, Josie. Self-care for someone who's had a really juicy start to zero to three, will it'll be very different for that teenager or adult. Whereas someone who's had an off lot of neglect up to three, it will be a lot of kind of therapeutic intervention and slow pace. So, and that's why teenagers are also different. The, often the teenagers who's out of control in class. I mean, and that's why it's very misunderstood. We're starting to you know, I don't know if you know about adverse childhood experiences. It's the ACE score that we mark. It was an American model that was devised to kind of 
tick, a bo- tick the boxes of how traumatized this child is. Usually the child is presenting in school with maybe being destructive to peers, disrespectful to teachers. And then when we kind of pair it all back, we look at what happened to this child that it's gone to this place. And some children and teenagers want to do better and some don't. And, and I suppose that's why, obviously, if you go into the teaching model, it can be very exhausting working in the area of teaching and education. Yeah, so I love that you are the first person who's ever said self-care varies. Like people, when you automatically, like you said, the buzzword of self-care, when you hear self-care, people automatically say, go take a bath, go for a walk, go outside, right? For you to say, honestly, self-care has to look different for it is what you need. I think that is going to be something that somebody needed to hear today because for me growing up, I thought self-care was that like go out and buy yourself a nice pair of clothes to get that quick hit to your (laughs) to your brain that you're happy now or go take a bath with some bubbles in it and feel good but it wasn't until I started doing the work in my internal game that my whole world my whole life started shifting and so I love that you're speaking to that because I had childhood trauma. So I grew up being abused as a child and thinking that was normal, that it was just normal. And so then growing up and realizing that it wasn't okay for my, it wasn't what my friends were going through. Like it wasn't normal. That became its own trauma. And I started, like you're saying, buried it and acted like it wasn't a thing, put that plastic smile on my face and faked it till I made it. And that served me for so long, but there comes a point where you hit a wall and you can't fake it till you make it. And so I love that you're speaking to like, go out there and find that help and look for that support, whether it be with a, like you were saying, a life coach or even different agencies that people could use to help them get through that. And I know for me, it was like a series of like childhood work, like inner child work. And do you have anything to say about inner child work that people could do for themselves? Yeah, it's much healthier to do inner child work with another. So either Mm -hmm. with a therapist, yeah work. because again coming back to we're interdependent beings mm-hmm. so like you think of everett your baby he's 10 months now like he's not going to be able to regulate himself mommy regulates him you know obviously he's when he's asleep he can he's asleep but the inner child work is best done in conjunction like obviously you're only at a therapist once a week or you have your life coach once a week Mm -hmm. you're doing journaling in between and listening to evoking music but it really is better to do it with support because our nervous system calms down through connection with the other with mm-hmm. another human and and that's the bit that sometimes i think people beat themselves up a lot about why can't i self-care like i have all this time the baby's asleep now and why why haven't i taken the bath why am i just scrolling on my facebook or why am i you know procrastinating you're doing that because actually what you need is connection with another human to spark you then to do the self-care stuff so like the work i would do a person will get one hour with me but then they get enough regulation through me to then go off and do the journaling the walking the yoga the hiking or whatever it is that they but so that's why a lot of people kind of beat themselves up like oh i'm so crap i'm not meditating i'm so lazy Mm. it's nothing to do with laziness it's to do with the terror of being on their own when they haven't had the nervous system regulated Mm. so it's quite scientific but it's quite natural when there isn't you know when your baby cries you pick your baby up you know and you when he's hungry a a well enough mother will know the baby isn't angry with me my baby's hungry so he's cross babies are they you know sometimes they don't want to get into their car seat he's 10 months now so they they go through all their i want i'm me you know you don't (laughs) own me and they have all their way of trying to keep their autonomy. And obviously with trauma, sometimes that's too hard for the baby to keep their autonomy because they get beaten or there's alcohol abuse involved so that it's not a safe environment. So the child shrinks, like if you think of the flowers in the evening, you know, the way the petals all go small when it's getting dark and then they come out again. So it's again, not what's wrong with us, it's what happened that stopped us in the flow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, that is so wild to think about, right? Because it's like, we don't have that control. Like as the grown up, the adult now, it's like what happened to us is that young child, we don't have that control of what happened, but now we have to kind of take back that control. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Parent ourselves yeah. through in the right interventions and yeah. And we will only do that when we're kind of at our rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we can easily as humans say, oh, she needs to go to therapy or she needs to go to a life coaching. 
everyone's path is really different and like some people's best even though god it's a terrible best is staying in destructive relationships maybe or you know being in strong addictive compulsive patterns with shopping or online gambling or alcohol or drugs however then for some people they just go i really want to be my best version for my kids because i want to enjoy my kids too it's not just for the kids it's like i want to be sober in my and sobriety isn't just not drinking Sobriety is that we're not workaholics and we're catching ourselves, you know, and slowing down. And every stage, as I said, evokes buried trauma. So, like, I don't want to terrify anyone listening, but it can be such an opportunity to heal through our children as well, mm -hmm. of allowing ourselves to play. Like, we have a gorgeous age now of, you know, there he'll be exploring the world and mm -hmm. looking at the world through his eyes. Everything is amazing. He doesn't need to go to Disney World, just being in the local park is Disney World. And our front yeah, yard is Disney World right now. Or just clean the kitchen <laughs> if mommy allows me to play with the pots and pans. So when we're traumatized, we're very, sometimes we think, I know I'm talking about my own story, like we can be very controlling, we want everything perfect and we don't mm -hmm. let the child be spontaneous because we can't be spontaneous. Mm -hmm. So we kind of nearly apologize, the child just wanting to climb and explore and everything is like, oh my God, you fall, don't do this, don't do this. And children need to, like they've done research now there's re I remember reading a book called Letting Go as Children Grow by Deborah Jackson. She has another book as well about co-sleeping. Her second book is they did research on toddlers actually. You know the way we're really scared with toddlers of that they're gonna like jump into the pool or you know, and of course we have to put safety measures up but if we teach a child they know their own limits you know mm. like I, I remember my children did a lot of climbing when they were younger and sometimes we'd be in the park and then I'd be feeling judged because like that she's a very neglectful mom because my daughter was like mm. so courageous of climbing up the frame quite young and so far actually she's a, she's on a skiing trip at the moment and she's really it's her first time skiing but the point being the chance she had for that movement was her foundation for being autonomous and mm flexible and sporty because she wasn't afraid you know so our smothering actually think of smothering think of like sometimes if we come from a lot of trauma we smother and that's not mothering mm -hmm. smothering is not mothering that's a quote like it's not and sometimes if we don't deal with our trauma we try to compensate and keep them in a glass cage and it's so interesting joseph because i have a lot of young people who come to me like the brain the adult brain doesn't fully really finish forming until we're 27 years old it's not 18 so a lot of young people come to me with really gorgeous parents so this like really loving but totally smothered like so these are like 24 year olds that have never lived out of home never been responsible for the cost of living given everything parents intervening all the time fixing everything getting their car getting their insurance and they're really depressed why why do you think they're depressed Full of anxiety oh, and depressed yeah. they don't know how to take care of themselves they are requiring somebody else to do it for them they've never learned they, to fail yeah they've been prevented oh. all the time from failing they don't feel the discomfort they don't know how to feel discomfort because mm -hmm. mom dad get in the way because mom and dad want to protect them mm -hmm. but they're actually smothering them and they're afraid of everything they're afraid to go on holidays they're afraid to meet a new boy they're afraid to take a risk to meet someone new for a coffee so the intention for mom and dad is mm. really pure and they want to keep them alive but they're actually smothering them and they're dying inside and i get that a lot and it is misguided love mm. so it's just something to reflect on i know i'm vulnerable to doing it as a parent so i really understand it of wanting to fix everything and want yes. you know and then letting them feel discomfort and failing like i know we hear all the quotes but it's like can we actually follow Do through it. with them yes. really hard to you know if your son has forgotten to bring his water i know it's not relevant to your 10 month old but it's like oh my god he's gonna like die and think he's gonna die of thirst like he's gonna die and it's like maybe i need to not go to the school and drop in the drink bottle because maybe he'll ask someone can he have a mm -hmm. drink of water or last teacher or maybe he won't forget his drink bottle the next day like it's thinking all the time every time you get them to do chores like before we came on the call my son has to feed the dogs and the cat if i do that then he doesn't get that experience of having to do life isn't all 
rosy. You know, we yep. have to teach our children to be uncomfortable, to ride it out. Mm-hmm. Oh, yes. I read Child Knows Best. I can't remember who wrote that oh, wow. book, but it That's was good. talking about how like literally when your child's learning to walk, you need to like sit on your hands. <laughs> like You need to sit yeah. on your hands and let so your true. child like fall because if they're not falling, they aren't going to learn and they're going to if they're not learning how to catch themselves when they fall, because we're always rescuing them, it's that same effect. And so when I first read that, it was like, wow, light bulb went off because it made perfect sense. But like, as you were speaking of like our being a mom, like our first thing is like save, like save this person. Like my goal, my job is to keep this child alive and like take care of this baby. But it takes a whole new shift in mindset to decide that no, like everything my baby's going through, they have to go through. They have to learn to fall. They have to learn to pick themselves up. Like you could be there to be the witness and hug them, take care of them and love them. But at the end of the day, we have to let them go through the development stages. And so that sitting on your hands part, literally I've had to do that. I had to yeah. like put my hand under my bum and be like, okay. Cause he's just starting to learn to walk yeah, and stand so, on his yeah. own. <laughs> And like children have such like the baby, the child knows best. It's such a good title for a book. Imagine if we could trust that more. We forget all the time. I'm just learning even by us having the chat. You know, we have like peanut brains. So we forget so quickly. And that's where knowing ourselves comes in. So when we know ourselves and know, we don't like when people try to fix us. We love when someone listens, but we don't want them to say, you know what you need to do now, Josie? You're just like, ah, like stop. Turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just want someone to listen when we're, and, and children need the same. Like, you, so we were saying about the teenagers, like, like most of the time when the teenagers come to me and I've been working a lot, a lot of years with them now, the healing happens from me just listening and having that capacity to hold the space mm-hmm. for them. And like, sometimes moms will be like, I don't know what you do with her, but she's like a different child. You know, she's meeting her friends again. She's coming out of her room. And I don't talk about any of that. Children, they don't need me to lecture about that Mm -hmm. stuff. They know it's not good for them to be on their screen too long. I just listen. And Mm -hmm. the skill of just having that capacity is what makes them then want to go and fly and try things out. And it is really rewarding to see a child come to me that's really scared to wanting like to go on holidays and Mm -hmm. go on the school tour before they didn't even go to the shop on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that is just beautiful because like you said, it's just that requiring of like holding that space. But in order to hold that space, you have to do your own work. Because when I first became a life coach and I was holding that space, it was the same thing. I sometimes things that people would say would trigger me and I would be able, I would catch it, but that was only because I was doing the work. And so if as a mom, as a parent in general, if you do that work, then when it comes time to even hold that space for your own child, like you've been talking about, I think that's like the umbrella of this conversation is when you do your work, you're able to hold that space yeah. for your kid yourself. Exactly. You're just more sober and you can see the light. I can see clearly now the rain has gone. Mm-hmm. Trauma is like rain, you know, it, it, it covers, I often describe trauma and we all have different versions of trauma because mm-hmm. see often what we do is we minimize, oh, it wasn't so bad. You know, because that's our way of coping, Mm -hmm. but everyone's trauma is real for them. And really the fact of being alive is trauma, but now Mm -hmm. that's the minimum, you know, but then there's extreme of like being an active addiction or dad leaving when I was really young or losing dad actually dying when I was really young or Mm -hmm. like sexual abuse. There's so many, or living in a war-torn country. So there, you know, there's so many different myriads being, it's a trauma for the children that I see that are middle class from really, really wealthy homes, but being smothered. That's Mm -hmm. a trauma because they haven't, they haven't been supported to know what's best. Everything is like, oh, we'll fix it for you. Come home straight away if you don't like college rather than go ride it out, Mm -hmm. stay a while, it might change. Then I'm just going to be in the car. I'm going to drive four hours, pick you up because I love you so much and I'm going, and we'll just be better. And and another thing, we are never meant to be our children's friends, ever. Mm -hmm. And that happens too. She's my bestie, so dangerous. We can really love our kids. I love my daughter. A lot of similar things in common, but I have to keep remembering to put the mom hat on and say Mm -hmm. the hard stuff sometimes that, you know, she needs to hear about developing and being kind and how to navigate being a human. She needs a mother, not, Mm -hmm. I'm not her friend. And if I start being her friend, it's dangerous. 
Yeah, I've heard that one a lot, a lot. And being a new mom about moms calling their kids besties. And so one of the, I've gotten a lot of great advice, especially doing this show and talking to beautiful moms. But the, one of the best advice I ever got was like, you are his guardian. Like you are like his guardian protector, but you are not his, tell him how to do, how to be. Like he gets to be himself. And your only job is to be the witness and the guardian. That was a mind shift for me was thinking of it that way. Because we, like you said, we have all that good intention when we're moms, like, let's go and rescue that kid for a school that doesn't want to be in college anymore. But thinking of like that reframe of I am the witness, like I am the watcher, I am the guardian. And this child is going to be this child, no matter what I do, like you could try so hard, right, to form and mold this kid and to be the person that you want him to be. But at the end of the day, we have to let them fly. The child would be depressed. See, what will happen is, yes, the child might try to be like you to get your love, but the child won't won't be happy. And we oh, don't want that. Like one. mother, you know the poem on children by Carol Gibran. Maybe I can read it if you want. Yes, please. Um, at, at the end or whatever. Yeah. And um, because it's that exact thing of they're not ours. We we're we're so blessed to hold space for them, but we don't mm -hmm. own them. They're not extensions of us. And that's mm -hmm. why when we heal our own wounds. If we don't heal our own wounds, then we're we're kind of going into that narcissistic territory of I need my child to perform. And now it's very different with our children knowing if they're very talented that you're encouraging them to go. Mm. We need smart people like you. We need people to research cancer. And but it's very different doing it with that energy. Then you're only going to be okay, and I'm only going to be okay if you get if you become a doctor. But if they really want to become a doctor, of course, then we support them and we help them research so yes i love that i didn't even know there was a poem that was yeah maybe i should exact, read it now when it's yes. when, when we're in the theme of it i'm saying those exact it. words because that was like such a big shift for me and i know that not a lot of when i talk to the older generation of how i'm raising everett and how i've taken li little pieces and i'm kind of making it my own like when i even told the title of like child knows best people are like no children don't know best like their yeah. instant reaction is is like no With the old like, school children should yeah. be seen in that third yes. they're in the vessels no yes no. I'm just like, wow, it blows me away. But I'm just so thankful that we have this information now, because I don't think like in my parents day, that they had all this research and information to know, like the things that I get to know now. Yeah. And like you said something really interesting there before I say the poem, it is about being compassionate, like to the generations before us, we have to first obviously get the support to deal with our frustration. But when we're truly kind of calm, we can respect they didn't have the information. Yeah. We had. Like we had books that said children are empty vessels. There was loads of child development stuff. You hear it still even people saying, oh, it doesn't matter what happened before mm -hmm. three. You don't even remember. That's great. Yes. It's so good it happened to baby. But actually, it's the entire opposite that actually for me, I was hospitalized as a baby a couple of times massive impact in my whole life and all my attachments i live with that trauma always and so in the olden days they didn't know that they thought leave the baby when i was yeah. left because they were like it's fine the baby won't even remember go and you know so now we know better my angelo who i love as a poet mm -hmm. she always says when we know better we do we better do. you know do your best and then when we know better so yeah this guy is from he was born in 1883 so he was from a totally different time and he was very ahead of his time and he died in 1931 so, so it's cal gibram the poet it says and a woman who held a babe against her bosom said speak to us of children so she's, she's asking this poet and he said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts. For they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls. For their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bowls from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow. 
that is stable. Wow. He's an amazing poet. Born January 1883 amazing. in the Lebanon. Amazing. It paints such a vivid picture and it gives you like chills. Like it's so true. Yeah. Yeah. That's everything. That's what self, you know, the first question you asked me, that's why do we self care? We self care so we can be that, what he says at the end there. For even as the child loves the arrow that flies, he loves also the bow that is stable. So like the biggest gift for a child is like mom's okay, mom's doing her thing, mom's her podcast, mom's her hobbies. The most distressing thing for a child is mom's in bed all day, mom's drinking, mom doesn't meet her friends anymore, mom doesn't even change, you know, so children love when even recently... My daughter's really into theater and she's get, obviously getting older now. And we had, my husband and I had booked a holiday and with COVID, all her theater things were changed. You know, it's been a really, obviously in the States as well, everything's been very, so they had changed her show that was supposed to be at Christmas, but then with Omicron, it got canceled. And then they were talking about it for Easter. And I was like, oh my God, that's when we booked our holiday. And she said, this is the child said to me. So there was a bit of me going, oh, I need to cancel the holiday. I can't miss her show. She's like, mom, please go on holidays. You and dad need to go on your own holiday. I don't need you to be there. You're going to be at so many other shows. Like she's basically saying, mind your own business. <laughs> you know, nicely. But she had the confidence to be like, you're not canceling your holiday. It's one show. I will be in so many more. That point being, oh. I was going, oh my God, I need to drop everything, you know, smother her, be in the front <laughs> row. Now I am mostly in the front row. But how many times are we in the front row for our needs and actually what the child needs? Don't use your children to be okay with yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't live through, you know, the beauty pageant things and the, all the different things we can live through. My son, my daughter, usually they'll thrive more if we thrive. Monkey see, monkey do. You know, then mm -hmm. how mom, what does mom do for self-care? How does mom, does mom gossip? How does mom deal with gossip? Someone was ringing. My daughter was in the background. I didn't even really think of her in the background. And, and I just said, let's not do this. I said, let's not just, let's not do this and just divert the conversation. And I'm always saying this to my daughter, change the subject, talk about a book you like. And she said, but it's so hard, mom, because you feel weird then, because that's what people do. We, we gossip in Ireland. We say we read people, which means we discuss, oh my God, what's Harriet, what's she wearing? She's so strange. Why is she going gray or whatever? You know, and I just think when we gossip as humans, I know when I've gossiped, I knew it in school. I used to gossip a lot in school, like say unkind things about people. I wasn't happy. Yeah. You never no. gossip. When you're happy, you might not do the same thing someone does. You might want to grow your hair gray, but you go, wow, I really admire that someone that she's that that works for her. Or if she wants to get Botox, we don't gossip. We go, wow, she seems really happy doing that. And that's so anytime we're complaining. And I tell this to teenagers, but we do it all the time. Look at all the social media. Look at all the comments complaining about Meghan Markle, complaining about they don't even know her. And they're like saying, I want my children to be kind people. Well, maybe you need to start being kind. Yeah, it all and begins so, with us. It all begins with us. As you were saying, like we're the mirrors for our children. We have to take that responsibility seriously and we have to do the work. That's the best. I always say on the show, the best thing I ever did before Everett was born was that work to figure out why I was people pleasing, why I was putting that mask on, why I was faking it till I make it, why I didn't feel good. That work has like spilled over into my life in a way that I, it blows me away. Like with my husband, with my parents, like it just blows me away what happens when you do the work for yourself. Yeah. And so yeah, I love that we're talking to this as self-care because that is so, it's so important. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you for having this conversation with us. I would love to hear any last thoughts that you have that's on your heart to share with the listeners today. It's never too late to do the internal work and, you know, and anything we've chatted about today, please don't beat yourself up because, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes then we can go, oh no, I didn't get sober till my child was six or, I didn't because we do work before they come and then stuff happens and trauma happens and trauma is so powerful that even if we want to do better sometimes it, it's like I often oh that's I remember I got distracted and I couldn't remember what I wanted to think what I wanted to say was it's like a really beautiful painting and then someone just coming with black paint and like ruining the whole painting you know it's to tread gently maybe and just find a, some kind of a spiritual practice not necessarily it doesn't have to be god but for some people it is or you know getting out in nature having something like crochet or sewing or knitting something that gets you out of too much thinking and taking a break from social media there's amazing things about social media and it can be so helpful to grow but just having you know just little like starting you know we know all these books there's so many books like that's why 
why don't any of these books work, Josie? Because people are trying to do it without the physical support of someone else. They say if you can make 1% change every day, but sometimes we can't even do that if we've had massive trauma. We need our self-care could be going to therapy every week and that taking a few months before we start. You know, I know with some of my clients, it might not look like anything's happening. And then I look back and I think, wow, I can get the transformation, but it doesn't happen like the seed that's growing. You just think it's never going to, think your son's never going to walk. And suddenly they're, you know, you can't remember them not walking. That's the push, like when the baby's coming even. It's all about pushing and life is never, I love this other lady, Edith Edgar. She survived the Holocaust. She wrote The Gift and The Choice. She wrote her first book at 91 years old, her second book at 93. She's now writing her third book, a cookbook with her daughter at 94. And she's like, it doesn't say anywhere life is going to be easy. That's our illusion. That's our fairy tale. Life is hard and challenging. And then we can make beautiful moments in the mist and have, Mm. you know, beautiful experiences. Like a child doesn't begin walking just from being in the mother's bosom to just going they have to go through falling they have to go tripping up they they have to hit their head off the side of you know all these uncomfortable things before they can walk 100 percent. and kids don't give up and sometimes along the way we give up like a child doesn't say oh i feel too embarrassed how stupid i look trying to learn how to walk they don't care there's like i want to walk the drive for a toddler to walk is nobody can get in their way i mean unless they're severely abused and strapped down and that's why it's so sad when massive abuse gets in someone's life they do get stunted like we look at all the orphanages over in chernobyl and children don't die from actually they, they, some of these children become autistic from not being touched it's like it's nothing to do with them not being fed but they just don't get enough touch contact so yeah it, it's it's a beautiful stage you have your son at and um, it feels like yesterday for me my son will be 13 on the 11th of march and like wow it's such a journey it feels like forever but also you're going oh my god it's just unbelievable blink of an eye oh thank you thank you for being here harriet will you share with us where the listeners can support you where they can follow you yeah and i can send you the links afterwards as well if you want to put them yeah so i'm on facebook harriet mcwigan mindset my full name mindset and then instagram harriet mcwigan mindset i have a lot of videos on my facebook page that you can go on to the video i will be going back to a podcast that i ran that i took a little bit of time out from on resilience so if people want to contact me then they can email me with um, mindfulpeeps at gmail.com and if they want me to send them a guided meditation a tailored one i can email that back to them or if they want to have a conversation about something that sparked in them, I'd be very happy to give them information that they might need. Oh, thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you very much, um, Josie. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much for listening to the Make Life Fun podcast. I am so filled with joy to have you here. If this show resonates with you, I have a gift for you. If you're feeling stuck, this freebie may be just what you need. I believe that if you know your why, it helps you get unstuck quicker. So to connect with your heart and know your why and figure out what it is that is most important to you, get the freebie, it's in the show notes. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast to get notifications each week. To support the show, you're invited to leave a tip in the tip jar. Information for all this is in the show notes. Sending love and light to the spirit listening to this today. Be blessed.